The god cards are a series of monsters which have their own specific type and attribute that were created just for them, and is used for no other cards in the game. So you would think that an archetype that was so important that it was given its own type and attribute, something that's not done for anything else, would be somewhat game changing. But at the best of times, the god cards were nothing more than a niche tech option. There are five divine beast type monsters in the game, which are also the only five divine attribute monsters in the game. Of those five, two of them are just different forms of the Winged Dragon of Ra, and basically interact exclusively with that card. Also, each of the three original god cards has individual support, with the Winged Dragon of Ra eclipsing all of them when it comes to the amount of support it's received. To start off, let's go over Obelisk the Tormentor. This was the first god card released in 2010 in the TCG, and released a couple of years earlier in the OCG. Despite the god cards being incredibly linked to each other, they were all released at different times in both the OCG and TCG for some reason. In the anime, the god cards were basically ultimate falcons on legs, with actual good effects, because they were basically immune to everything and had like 20 different effects that could apply to whatever situation they needed. The god cards kind of acted as video game boss monsters, where they had different phases and different kinds of effects depending on what kinds of things you had in the field, or whatever they thought would be cool for that moment. So when they transferred these ridiculously broken cards over to the real game, where there just literally was not enough text on a card in order to print all the effects they had, they went with a rather lackluster option of just giving them a handful of the effects they once had, while also ignoring a lot of the protection that would probably have made them playable. That is, except for Obelisk. Obelisk is a 4,000 attack monster that requires three tributes to normal summon. Its normal summon cannot be negated, and when normal summoned, other cards and effects cannot be activated during that window, a trait that all three of the god cards share. Then Obelisk goes on to have its own effects, where, on a spell speed 1, you can tribute two monsters you control, including itself, to destroy all monsters your opponent controls. However, this card cannot attack during the turn it activates this effect. If this card is special summoned, it's sent to the graveyard during the end phase. And finally, neither player can target this monster with card effects. It was this last line of its effect that allowed Obelisk the Tormentor to actually see competitive play. When it was first released in 2010, gigantic monsters that cannot be targeted were kind of rare, and non-targeting removal was even rarer. So bringing out Obelisk the Tormentor could be paramount to having an unstoppable boss monster on the field, simply because it had high attack while being untargetable. Nowadays though, the average meta deck can easily bring out multiple forms of non-targeting removal and monsters that can beat over Obelisk the Tormentor by battle, which was not the case in the early 2010s. So Obelisk the Tormentor was often used as a single one of in frog decks, since back then they were geared more towards tribute fodder for monarchs and light and darkness dragon, and when dragon rulers came out in 2013, Obelisk the Tormentor saw play as a side tech option in the mirror match, because dragon ruler decks themselves had a hard time with non-targeting removal, or getting more than 4,000 attack on the field. But it was only really a side deck option because the main other meta threat at the time, spellbooks, had their best form of removal in Spellbook of Fate, which was a non-target banish. Then, after the Dragon Ruler format had its power level reined in by some choice bands, new support cards were released, Obelisk the Tormentor fell out of play, and then kinda stopped seeing competitive play ever since. However, Obelisk was only the second most played god card in the competitive scene, as we'll see a little bit later on in this video. Next up, we have the Winged Dragon of Ra. This card was released two years later in 2012, or 2009 in the OCG, and has the same summoning protection effects as Obelisk the Tormentor, and also on its summon, its attack and defense become equal to the amount of life points you paid when you summon the card, where you can pay all but 100 life points in order to grant this card that amount of attack and defense. And you are not able to choose the amount of life points you pay, you have to pay all but 100. So if you summon this card with a full 8,000 life points, it will have 7,900 attack and defense. The Winged Dragon Raw also has an effect where it cannot be special summoned at all. And finally, it has the non once per turn effect where you can pay 1000 life points in order to destroy one monster on the field, which is kind of counterintuitive with its attack gain effect because you won't actually be able to destroy anything unless you find a way to gain life points after you bring out the Winged Dragon of Raw. And the first version of the Winged Dragon of Raw was absolutely terrible. It had no protection like Obelisk which was strange as they decided to regress the protection of the god cards rather than adding more onto it, so its attack point gain could be reset by any kind of negate that just kind of breathed on it. And it was already making you super vulnerable for activating its attack gain effect in the first place because you only had 100 life points left, and Gagaga Cowboy was a very common staple in the following years after it came out, which could burn you for 800 points of damage on a generic rank 4 summon. Of the three original god cards, the Winged Dragon of Ra was easily the worst which is kind of funny because the anime counterpart that it was based on 
was the most overpowered out of the main three, which is probably why they gave it a massive amount of support later on, which simply exists to simulate its many anime effects. And finally, we have Slifer the Sky Dragon. This card came out later in the same year of 2012 as the Winged Dragon of Ra, and came out two years after the Winged Dragon of Ra on the OCG in 2011. I'm not sure why they staggered the release of the three god cards so much, but it obviously wasn't in order to make them stronger. Slifer the Sky Dragon has the effect tied to its summoning condition, let her share with the previous two, and its attack and defense are based on the amount of cards you have in your hand times 1000. And unlike the Winged Dragon of Ra, this card can be special summon. It's simply sent to the graveyard during the end phase just like Obelisk the Tormentor. And finally, if a monster is summoned to your opponent's side of the field in attack position, they lose 2,000 attack, and then if the monster's attack is reduced to zero, it's destroyed, which is actually a really good effect. This would be an excellent floodgate effect to have on another monster that wasn't so difficult to bring out and lacked absolutely all kinds of protection. Since, just like the Winged Dragon of Ra, they didn't give Slifer the Sky Dragon any form of inherent protection, where it would definitely have benefited from being untargetable like Obelisk. Over the years, they did release some generic support for the god cards, either in the form of cards which interacted with their Divine Beast tag or Divine Attribute, list the card's name specifically, or allowed you to tribute summon with the three tributes easier. In 2014, they released Mound of the Bound Creator, which is a field spell card that makes it so level 10 or higher monsters in the field can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects. In addition, if one of these monsters destroys a monster by battle, your opponent takes 1,000 points of damage. And then, if this card in the field is destroyed, you get to add a divine monster from your deck to your hand. So the floating effect of Mound of the Bound Creator is one of the few ways to actually search out the three god cards. Now its on-field protection actually gives the god cards protections they probably should have had built in from the beginning, as being untargetable and indestructible is actually really good. And the field spell card was obviously made in order to try to rectify some of the early design choices of the three original god cards. Although requiring the field spell card to be on the field, which itself doesn't have any protection, didn't really solve the problem. In fact, it was mostly played in non-god card decks to make use of the fact that it works on any level 10 or higher monsters, if it was used at all in competitive play. In the same year, they also released Ra's Disciple, which is a monster that can special summon two other copies of itself from your hand or deck on its summon. However, the card then has restrictions, where you cannot tribute these cards, except if it's for the tribute summon of the three original god cards, as it lists all of them exactly by name, and also you cannot special summon other monsters, except by the effect of Ra's Disciple. So, funnily enough, because of this card's restrictions unlocking you into not being able to special summon other monsters, it's actually a really good card to give to your opponent with something like Give and Take, in order to completely lock them out of special summoning monsters. It is actually what got Give and Take limited in Duel Links, because it was one of the few ways to lock down your opponent, since they don't really have floodgates included in that game. However, since Ron's Disciple didn't actually give you an additional summon, just provided three monsters in the field to be tributed for the god cards, it's actually not that useful for bringing them out. Two years later, in 2016, they released a card called True Name. This card is meant to be another searcher for the god cards, although it's actually harder to use than Mount of the Bound Creator, because what you do in order to activate the effect is declare a card name, then look at the top card of your deck. If the top card of your deck is that card name, then you get to add it to your hand, then you get to take a divine monster from your deck, and either add it to your hand or special summon it from the deck. However, if you get the name incorrect, then you just send the card to the graveyard. And since the Winged Dragon Raw can't be special summoned, the card only really works to bring out Obelisk the Tormentor or Slifer the Sky Dragon. In 2020, along with some Winged Dragon Raw support, they released a card called Egyptian God Slime, which is a fusion monster that can be brought out by triveting a level 10 aqua monster with zero attack. So cards like the Trap Card Metal Reflect Slime. And while it's on the field, it can't be destroyed by battle, has 3000 attack and defense, and can be treated as one or three tributes for the tribute summon of a monster. So obviously an excellent card in order to bring out the God Cards just as long as you play Metal Reflect Slime, which can be searched out of the deck immediately during the battle phase with Reactor Slime, and then activated the same turn. Or with the raw support card Guardian Slime. And Egyptian God Slime is definitely one of the better cards released in order to help bring out the original God cards, although it's not the best one. In 2021, they released a whole bunch of other support cards for the God cards, including a card called Soul Crossing. This is a quick play spell card which can only be activated during the main phase that allows you to tribute one Divine Beast monster from your hand, and allows you to tribute monsters on both players' side of the field. So basically, you can use Soul Crossing in order to tribute three of your opponent's monsters for one of your god cards, which is easily the best way to bring one of them out. However, because Soul Crossing is actually good with its effect, because it even gives you an additional normal summon for this tribute, so you don't have to waste your one normal summon, is that if you use this card, you can only use one card or effect per turn, not counting a god card's effect, and this restriction lasts until the end of your next turn. So, if you use this during your opponent's turn, you can only use one card effect in your next turn. 
However, another distinction to this card over other similar things like the Monarch Stormforth or Soul Exchange is that Soul Crossing actually works on immune boss monsters because it treats the effect as a tribute summon rather than the effect of a spell card allowing you to tribute your opponent's monsters. Which is a distinction that matters for things like Ultimate Falcon. So Soul Crossing is definitely one of the best pieces of God card support created, which is why it has that really awful restriction to allow you to do anything else for the two turns after using it. Also, the same year they released Divine Evolution, which is a buff for one of your God cards or the Wicked versions, which gives it 1000 attack and defense, makes it so all of their effects are spell speed 4, and if they declare an attack, forces your opponent to send one monster they control to the graveyard. There's also the Ultimate Divine Beast, a continuous trap card which has the effect where if your opponent declares an attack, you can discard a spell or trap card from your hand in order to special summon a Divine Beast monster from your graveyard defense position and redirect the attack to that monster. And then during the end phase, if you control a Divine Beast monster, you destroy all cards your opponent controls and activate their effects on the field this turn. And both of these cards seem like they'd be pretty good god card support, except for the fact they kind of don't really help getting the cards of the field or in the graveyard, and they might be considered more of a win more option in the case of Divine Evolution or the second effect of Ultimate Divine Beast. However, you may even think Ultimate Divine Beast literally special summons Obelisk or Slifer to the field every turn. How could this possibly not be a good card to get the god cards out? Well, the devil is really in the details in this case. It only activates its effect if your opponent declares an attack, which means it's a sitting duck until your opponent activates the trigger, which is the reason why cards like Mirror Force don't really see play, even though it can destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters, but Lightning Storm sees playing pretty much every side deck, even though it has an effect to do the same thing. Relying on a battle trigger is one of the worst kinds of triggers, and is just too slow in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Additionally, it requires you to discard specifically a spell or trap card in order to activate the effect, which means you can't even discard a god card to the graveyard in order to help set up its effect. So you need some other way to get the god cards in the graveyard. And some of the best cards to discard are monster cards, because graveyard effects are just much more common on monsters than they are on spell or trap cards. But in addition to these more generic god card support cards, they did also have a series of incredibly specific ones. Let's go over Obelisk and Slifer first, since they definitely have the least amount. When it comes to specific support cards for Obelisk himself, he only really has one that's released in the TCG called Fist of Fate, where it's a quick play spell card that can only be activated if you control Obelisk the Tormentor, where it allows you to negate the effects of one monster your opponent controls and destroy it, and then if you do, for the rest of this turn, it negates all effects of that monster with the same original name, kind of in the same way as Called by the Grave. In addition, the activation of this card cannot be negated, and it does not target so it can be seen as a way to outpower boss monsters, and it gains an additional effect if activated during your main phase, where you get to also destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. Now, this card definitely seems like a strong card. It's a quasi spell speed for destruction of one of your opponent's monsters that does not target, and it negates its effects. So it can remove pretty much anything your opponent controls other than something that's just immune to card effects. And then it's a Harpy's Feather Duster on top of that. But this is just another win more card that doesn't actually help get Obelisk on the field in the first place, or search it out, which has historically been the hardest thing to do with the god cards. There's also two pieces of Obelisk support in the OCG that are not released in the TCG yet, which are a little bit better in actually helping getting Obelisk on the field. One of them is called Soul Energy Max, which is a trap card that allows you to tribute two monsters you control if you control an Obelisk in order to destroy as many monsters your opponent controls as possible, and then inflict 4000 points of damage to your opponent. And this effect is actually one of the highest amount of burn damage inflicted by a singular card. So requiring Obelisk and two tributes to use the effect is definitely warranted. The better part about this card is definitely its graveyard effect though, where during the battle phase you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to add Obelisk to your hand from your deck or graveyard, then immediately you can normal summon that Obelisk if you have the required materials. And then there's Magical Trick Mirror, which is another normal trap card that has the effect where, if your opponent declares an attack, you can target one spell card in your opponent's graveyard in order to set it to your field. And then its more useful effect is tied to its graveyard effect, where you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to send a monster reborn from your hand or field to the graveyard in order to special summon Obelisk from the graveyard in defense position. And then if it activates its effect during your opponent's turn, all of your opponent's monsters must attack that Obelisk. And since it has 4000 defense and this card can be used during the battle phase, it could be a way to do a lot of defensive reflect damage to your opponent. And outside of these three cards, Obelisk doesn't really have any other specific support cards that's just for him. Next up we have Slifer the Sky Dragon. When it comes to specific support for Slifer, it really only has Thunder Force Attack, which is a quick play spell card that can only be activated if you control Slifer the Sky Dragon on the field, and just like Fist of Fate, its activation cannot be negated. And it has the effect to destroy as many face-up attacks to monsters your opponent controls as possible. And then it has an additional effect, 
if it's activated in your main phase, where you get to draw a number of cards equal to the monsters destroyed with the effect, but you can only attack with one monster during this turn. Which again seems like an amazing effect since it's basically a Raigeki that can draw you a whole bunch of cards. But since it doesn't let you get Slifer on the field quicker, it's actually not that useful. Because that is definitely the biggest problem with all of the god cards. The resources to just get them on the field in the first place are so difficult to accomplish when you're trying to play through your opponent's disruptions that anything that requires a specific named god card to be on the field when they're already hard to search out is just not viable no matter what their effects are. And Slifer doesn't really have any other support specific to it, except for the Joker's straight archetype. You see, there's a series of support for these three cards, which allows you to really easily get three monsters in the field with their spell card called Joker's Straight, which allows you to special summon a Queen's Knight from your deck at the cost of a discard from your hand, then allows you to add a King's Knight from your deck to your hand, then immediately normal summon it which will proc King's Knight's effects in order to special summon Jack's Knight from your deck. And since Joker's Straight is a straight get three monsters in the field without using up your normal summon, it has restrictions where you can't special summon from the extra deck for the rest of the turn except for light warrior monsters. And the card recycles itself to your hand during the end phase. And this definitely allows you to use those three monsters to go into any of the god cards. But the reason this archetype is more specific to Slifer is because of one of their support cards called Thunder Speed Summon. Which is a quick play spell card that has the effect where, during the main or battle phase, immediately after the effect resolves you can normal summon one level 10 monster, or if you control the three King's Knight cards, you can apply an additional effect which allows you to add a level 10 non-dark monster with question mark for attack from your deck to your hand, where you then immediately normal summon a level 10 monster. And what do you know, Slifer is a non-dark level 10 monster with question mark for attack and defense. Although, so is the Winged Dragon of Ra. So I guess technically it could be support for both of these cards. Speaking of that, let's go over the Winged Dragon of Ra. The Winged Dragon of Ra has received way more support specifically than all of the other god cards. Probably combined as two of the five Divine Beast monsters in the game are just different forms of the Winged Dragon of Ra. We have the Winged Dragon of Ra of Mortal Phoenix, which can only be summoned from the graveyard if the Winged Dragon of Ra is sent from the field to the graveyard, and cannot be special summoned in other ways. When it's summoned, other cards and effects cannot be activated in response to it, it's baseline immune to other card effects, has 4,000 attack and defense, and you can pay 1,000 life points in order to send a monster from the field to the graveyard on a non-once per turn effect. And then during the end phase, this card is sent to the graveyard where you can then summon the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode from your hand deck or graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. So, the Winged Dragon of Raw Immortal Phoenix kind of has the effect the original one should have had, being immune to card effects and having a high baseline attack and defense, while being able to actually use its effect to send your opponent's monsters to the graveyard. Although, since the activation requirement requires you to have the card in the graveyard already, and to have the original Winged Dragon of Raw both hit the field and then enter the graveyard while it's there, it's really more of a gimmick than it's an actual usable card. Unlike the card it actually summons from the deck during the end phase. Next up we have the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode, which is easily the most used god card, and is actually just a pure staple card that has seen tons of competitive play. Which is kind of funny because it's just a random side support for the Winged Dragon of Raw, the worst god card, which technically makes Sphere Mode the best god card by a mile because of its massive amount of success. As what it does is it cannot be special summoned and in order to normal summon this card you have to tribute three monsters on either side of the field. And that's the main benefit of this card. You can tribute this card with three of your opponent's monsters which bypasses pretty much all card effects, except ones which would prevent you from normal summoning in the first place. So if your opponent is playing a whole bunch of unbeatable monsters, or just a whole bunch of monsters with negates or quick effects, what you can do is slide in the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode during game 2 in order to easily out all of them with the least amount of resources, i.e. just one monster from your hand and giving up your normal summon. There aren't really cards that out more unbeatable boss monsters with one card from your hand than the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode, to the point where sometimes people only end on boards with only two or less monsters just to play around Sphere mode if they think their opponent has one, which is also a benefit. Sphere Mode also has the effect where, if you're actually using this card's god card support abilities, you can tribute this card in order to special summon the Winged Dragon of Ra from your hand or deck, ignoring its summoning conditions, and then setting its attack and defense to 4000. So actually a pretty good way of bringing out the original Winged Dragon of Ra. Especially if you have Immortal Phoenix in your graveyard ready to come out if it's simply breathed upon because it still has no protection. And then they also released a couple of other Winged Dragon of Ra support cards. There's Guardian Slime, which can special summon itself from your hand when you take damage, and allows you to search out a Winged Dragon of Raw Spell or Trap card from your deck if it's sent from your hand or field to the graveyard. There's also Ancient Chant, which allows you to actually search out the Winged Dragon of Raw from your deck, and then immediately allows you to tribute summon one additional monster during your main phase this turn. Which is actually a great piece of support for a specific god card, 
because it actually does the ever important thing of allowing you to search out the card, which all the other specific god card supports are lacking. Really, they should print an ancient chant for both Oblis and Slifer, and it's kind of a shame that it only works on the Winged Dragon of Ra. Additionally, it has a graveyard effect, where you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to make it so that if you tribute some of the Winged Dragon of Ra this turn, its original attack and defense become the original attack and defense of the monsters tributed for its tribute summon. And since this is a lingering effect granted by a spell card, it actually keeps the attack gains if it's negated on the field, since you can't negate a lingering effect, except if you remove the card from the field or flip it face down. There's Millennium Revelation, which allows you to send a Divine Beast monster from your hand to the graveyard to surge out Monster Reborn, and then has another effect where you can send this card from your field to the graveyard in order to allow you to use Monster Reborn to special summon the Winged Dragon Raw from your graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. But then you have to send the Winged Dragon Raw from your field to the graveyard during the end phase. There's Dark Spell Regeneration, which is a trap card that can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack that allows you to steal a spell card from your opponent's graveyard, and has a graveyard effect in order to send a monster reborn from your hand or field to the graveyard to special summon the Winged Dragon Raw from your graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. Then it sends one monster your opponent controls to the graveyard. There's Sun God Unification, which is a continuous trap card that allows you to basically copy the effect of the Winged Dragon of Ra's normal summon of paying all your life points only have 100 left in order to grant that amount of attack to your Winged Dragon of Ra. And then has an effect where you contribute a Winged Dragon of Ra in order to gain those life points back. And since it's a continuous trap card, can be used in response to your Winged Dragon of Ra maybe getting destroyed by one of your opponent's card effects. And finally, there's Blaze Cannon the specific quick play spell card made for the Winged Dragon of Ra in the same vein as Fist of Fate and Thunder Force Attack, where its activation and effect can't be negated and allows you to grant the Winged Dragon of Ra you control three effects, where it becomes unaffected by your opponent's card effects, and if it declares an attack, you can tribute any number of your monsters that did not declare an attack in order to give their attack points to Ra. Then, after damage calculation, if you attacked, you can send all monsters your opponent controls to the graveyard, with all three of these effects only lasting until the end phase of this turn. Now, what's funny with all these support cards of the Winged Dragon of Ra is that each of these new pieces of support are just trying to give the original Winged Dragon of Ra back some of the effects it had from the original anime, to kind of give you an indication of how many effects the original god cards had, and how completely stripped of them they were when they were imported to the actual card game. And even with all of this support, the Winged Dragon of Ra still hasn't really seen any competitive play, even though the Winged Dragon of Ra Sphere mode has seen mountains amounts of success. So, now that we've gone over the god cards and all of their support, why exactly did the god cards fail as an archetype or mechanic? Well, because, funnily enough, they're actually really hard to search out, and you have to build your entire deck around them in the first place. Only the Winged Dragon of Ra has a card that specifically surges it out in the TCG, with the other two god cards just kind of relying on generic support that requires you to jump through hoops in order to really search them out. You can surge out Obelisk with Card of the Soul though, but only if you still have 8,000 life points left and Slifer with Thunder Speed Summon, but only if you have three specific monsters in the field. In addition to them actually being difficult to search out in the first place, you have to dedicate three monsters in the field and have an available normal summon for them to actually come out. And this in itself is not that difficult to accomplish, assuming your opponent has zero disruption. The average meta deck has to be able to play through at least one form of disruption, otherwise it's not considered competitive. So if you're able to provide two forms of disruption, you can kind of shut down your opponent's entire turn, assuming generic scenarios. So with this in mind, getting three monsters on the field and a specific name card in your hand, it's already hard to do either of those two things in the first place, which just makes it so the card you do bring out has to be absolutely worth the effort, where none of the original god cards are worth that effort. So the ideal situation is being able to successfully resolve Soul Crossing in order to normal summon them from your hand during your opponent's turn. But still, in that circumstance, you still need to have the god cards in your hand in the first place, and they're dead cards in your hand unless you're able to actually provide the tribute fodder outside of that. And a lot of the support cards revolve around them being on the field already, which is the hardest thing to accomplish with them. So, it's a combination of the cards being too hard to bring out, and not being worth the effort in order to bring them out, with all of the support requiring them to be on the field already. The thing is, there are archetypes in the game which require a whole bunch of tributes in order to hit the field, which have seen competitive play in the past so it's not like the concept can't work. The two best examples are the True Draco and Monarch archetypes. The True Dracos are able to hit the field a lot easier because they have the effects that allow you to tribute continuous spell and trap cards in addition to monsters, and they all have effects in the field that allow you to gain additional advantage immediately. And because they primarily rely on tribute summons, usually only a single one, they're able to play a whole bunch of floodgates to stop their opponent from playing. Whereas with the God card and its support, each one of them requires three tributes, which usually involves a lot of special summoning and playing other resources, 
where you can't just reliably floodgate your opponent with floodgates, because you actually need to perform a lot of special summons. And there's also the Monarch Archetype, which was able to solve its problem of requiring tributes for all of its high-level monsters by just printing a whole bunch of Spell or Trap cards that allow them to cycle through their deck quicker, search out their key cards like crazy, and easily supplement their tribute costs through Spell and Trap cards and vassals that grant them extra tribute summons, bring themselves out of the graveyard infinitely, or summon during your opponent's turn for their immediate effects. Whereas the best thing the god cards have in comparison is Ancient Chant that allows you to search out only the worst god card, and Soul Crossing, which can allow you to summon the god card during your opponent's turn, but only Slifer has an effect that's actually useful during your opponent's turn, who is one of the hardest to search out ones outside of Thunder Speed Summon, which is not easy to use at all, or using MST on your own Mound of the Bound Creator, or stacking the top of your deck and then using True Name in order to special summon it from the deck. So, in conclusion, why did the god cards fail? Well, because they don't do enough on the field by themselves to justify the resources required to bring them out. And their only support consistently only works while they're already on the field in the first place, where their biggest weakness is just hitting the field in the first place. So, if they were to help fix the god cards to be more usable, they'd have to add more ways to actually get the cards on the field, rather than more cards that interact with them while they're already on the field. So if they had something like Ancient Chant that worked on all of the god cards, that would definitely go a long way to help. If they had more cards like Egyptian God Slime that can be treated as three tribute summons and special summoned easier, that would go a long way to alleviate the massive resource requirement required in order to have them get on the field. And if the specific cards made for them that required them to be on the field had a dual nature instead, where they instead had a good effect that could be activated while the card was on the field, or had a good way of searching the card out if it was not, that would be miles better than what they are now. Which seems to be the direction they're taking with the new Obelisk support, as that's basically what Soul Energy Max does. And to end off this video, I should probably talk about Halakti the Creator of Light. This is an OCG-only card that allows you to instantly win the duel if you're able to special summon this card from your hand by tributing the three original god cards on your side of the field. I imagine one of the reasons they don't want to give you too many easy ways to get the three god cards out is because Halakti exists, and can allow you to win the duel too easily, which is kind of funny to think about. All right, and that's the video. Are there any other major god card supports that I might have missed? Or do you have ideas for future videos similar to this one? If so, I'd love to hear about those things down in the comments.